Water is a powerful force. It carves canyons into stone, grinds cliffs into sand, and is essential for sustaining life on our planet. But in all its glory, it is a force that cannot be contained. Japan, 2011. A 9.0 mega thrust earthquake, one of the strongest ever recorded. It's just off the eastern coastline. Earthquakes are routine in Japan. However, the tsunami that followed would prove to be deadly. Once the waves receded, over 15,000 lives were lost and countless buildings destroyed. One of the hardest hit structures was the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The tsunami knocked out its generators, causing the facility to melt down, releasing a cloud of radiation far into the Pacific Ocean. This would become one of the worst natural disasters Japan has ever seen. Dr. Daniel Cox, professor of civil and construction engineering at Oregon State University, was in Japan when the 2011 earthquake hit. The 2011 tsunami was uh, very unique in some sense because Japan was considered to be well prepared for a tsunami and it was a disaster. So I think one thing we learned is that we have to really take this seriously and figure out what are the best choices that we can make along the coastline and how do we deal with the potential for this uh, tsunami when it hits the coast. Why are researchers at Oregon State University so interested in the 2011 Japanese disaster? Because there is a little known fault line located just off the Pacific Northwest's coastline, the Cascadia Subduction Zone. The Cascadia Subduction Zone is the confluence of two plates and these plates are pushing against each other. One plate is being pushed down, they're moving, and these plates are locked together. And they're, as they move, they just increase the stress and the energy between these two plates. And it's released suddenly. And so hundreds of years of accumulated energy is released in about five minutes. The Cascadia Subduction Zone, it runs from Northern California all the way up to Vancouver Island, BC. So this is you know, hundreds of miles of coastline that will be affected. There are different types of rupture events. Some could only be partial rupture, where just part of that subduction zone goes. The other one, the, the, what we call the big one, or the really big one, is say magnitude 9.0, where the entire rupture is, it's the entire uh, subduction zone that ruptures. So we're looking at a wave that would uh, hit the entire coast of the, the Pacific Northwest. So the entire Pacific Northwest would be affected. I think even as important, the major metro areas will be affected. So um, Portland, uh, Seattle, they'll be affected by the intense uh, ground shaking. So it's going to be a, a pretty big event for the entire Pacific Northwest. We now know that a large-scale event can occur because of the research being conducted at Oregon State University's OH Hinsdale Wave Research Laboratory. The OH Hinsdale Wave Research Laboratory is a large-scale coastal engineering research facility. It's easily the largest one in the United States and it's in the top five to eight in the world. It's very special because it has two wave makers, two different uh, tanks with two different wave makers, but they both are capable of making a tsunami type wave, which is what sort of sets it apart from other facilities. In addition to studying how tsunamis impact coastal structures, researchers at Oregon State University use sea cores to date past events. A researcher at Oregon State has gone out and done a lot of seafloor cores. And what we can do, we can core the seafloor a lot like you core a tree. And so you can look at the layers of sediment and you can sort of read the history or interpret the history of what's happened in the ocean. And there's a lot of things you can learn from the seafloor cores. But one of the things we can look at is when there's a sudden um, sediment deposit that would be land-based sediments, we call that turbidites. And the turbidites will tell us when um, the tsunamis have happened in the past. I believe we have about 18,000 years worth of seafloor data, so we've gone down back 18,000 years. From that, we know that tsunamis happen on an average of every three to 500 years. Along with studying the geological record, researchers are able to pinpoint the most recent event by analyzing 300-year-old Japanese documents describing what they call an orphan tsunami, or a tsunami that has no earthquake preceding it. 
The Japanese called that the orphan tsunami because the Japanese were used to having earthquake uh, generated tsunamis. There was no earthquake that preceded this, so they didn't, they didn't have any parentage. And they called that the orphan tsunami because they didn't have a generating earthquake. The reports of an orphan tsunami are important because they tell researchers that around 300 years ago, the last earthquake occurred along the Cascadia subduction zone, meaning another one could happen at any time. But if a tsunami and large-scale earthquake were to hit the west coast, many of the buildings would not withstand the forces. Well, we know from our own studies, from the Indonesian tsunami and from the Japanese tsunami, that light wood frame structures do not fare particularly well against tsunamis. Um, and about 95% of the structures on the Oregon coast are light wood frame. So things that are built out of wood, like your regular houses, um, are gonna see a lot of damage during the tsunami. So anything that's right on the margin. Um, the nice part is light wood frame structures fare very well during earthquakes. They're unlikely to collapse and kill you during earthquakes. So if you're out of the inundation zone and you have one of those houses, you're better off on the coast than having um, other types of construction. Even though much of our infrastructure is not prepared to endure an event generated from the Cascadia subduction zone, there are many researchers attempting to change that. Because of this research, we now know that if you are caught in an earthquake on the coast, it is better to run to high ground than to attempt to drive. You may only have mere minutes to escape the wave, and every second counts. For, let's say, the really big one, the, the 9.0, the expected ground shaking will last for about five minutes. After that point, depending on where you are on the coast, the tsunami can arrive anytime as early as 15 minutes or could take as long as 30 to 40 minutes, depending on where you are on the coastline. The important thing is that the time is in minutes. It's not in hours, not in days, but you have minutes to make a decision and enact that plan and get to high ground. But because of the research being conducted at Oregon State University, we may be able to limit the devastation caused by the Cascadia subduction zone and avoid a disaster similar to the 2011 Japanese tsunami.